uh, hi everyone uh, today I'm going to cover uh, the process of hemostasis which is a very important physiological process that stops bleeding so the objectives of uh, today's session are to describe the three mechanisms that contribute to hemostasis identify the stages of blood clotting and explain the various factors that promote and inhibit blood clotting and then contrast and compare the intrinsic and the in extrinsic pathways towards the formation of prothrombinase which is very important for the common pathway or the start of the common pathway of blood clotting then discuss the role of vitamin K in the formation of clotting factors we have many clotting factors and vitamin K is essential for the formation of four of these factors then I will discuss the process of fibrinolysis the lysis of the clot after its formation the clot will stay for a short time until the until repair of the damaged vessel happens then the clot should be lysed by the process of fibrinolysis and as I also will describe its importance then I will list conditions that are associated with excessive bleeding I will give you a few examples of excessive bleeding and possible causes so hemostasis is the sequence of responses that stop bleeding or blood loss from blood vessel there are three mechanisms that reduce the blood loss as you can see here we have blood vessel that was injured by any reason for example trauma the first thing that happens after the uh, injury of a blood vessel is vascular spasm so this is the first mechanism there is contraction of the muscles or the, or the vascular circ uh, circular muscles that are present in the blood vessel wall and this will reduce the diameter or the radius of the blood vessel and reduce the blood flow through the damaged area so vascular spasm when an artery or arteriole is damaged vascular smooth muscle cells will contract immediately this response is very fast and this will reduce bleeding then the second mechanism as you can see here is the aggregation of these tiny small blood cells and these are the platelets so platelet plug formation platelets stick to parts of the damaged blood vessel then they become activated they will release uh, the content of their granules and this will lead to the accumulation of more platelets so platelets will accumulate in a very large number and this is a very good example of positive feedback mechanism then the last mechanism or the third mechanism is the clot formation it is blood clotting or coagulation which is a complex cascade of enzymatic reactions and here we have the different clotting factors that are involved and this will lead to the fibrin mesh formation and finally the clot formation and i will talk in details about the second and third mechanism of hemostasis please uh, don't uh, confuse yourself with the platelet plug formation and blood clotting these are two different processes the platelet plug is solely formed by platelets while the clot is formed by a fibrin uh, network or mesh and the, inside this mesh we have different types of blood vessels that are trapped and I will stress on this concept in the coming slides so let's talk about the platelet plug formation first of all the platelets will adhere to the site of uh, injury where the collagen fibers and the damaged uh, endothelium we have exposed collagen fibers and damaged endothelial cells that line the blood vessels that this will lead to the adhesion of some platelets that are circulating in the blood so platelets contact and stick to the part of the damaged blood vessel such as the collagen fibers then the uh, platelets that adhere to the site of 
damage or injury will release their content or the content of their granules and this is called platelet release reaction platelets change their shape they interact with each other and they release the contents of their vesicles or granules such as adb serotonin and thromboxan a2 and these mediators have different effects for example serotonin and thromboxan a2 will cause vasoconstriction and this will help the vascular spasm or the blood vessel spasm that was the first step or, or the first mechanism in hemostasis and eventually this will reduce or decrease the blood flow through the damaged blood vessel or the damaged area and this will reduce bleeding uh, ADB and thromboxan A2 activate nearby platelets so the ADB that is released and thromboxan A2 will recruit additional platelets to come and stick or adhere to the site of uh, injury then finally the last step in platelet uh, plug formation is platelet aggregation we can see due to the release of different mediators many platelets uh, became adherent to the site of uh, injury and this uh, and this resulted in the formation of platelet plug that try to seal or bridge the gap in the injured blood vessel so released ATP makes platelets in the area sticky they adhere to each other and recruit newly activated platelets to form a platelet plug it is very effective in preventing blood loss in a small vessel and it occurs only at the site of uh, injury it doesn't occur in a normal non-damaged blood vessels and platelet plug is effective in small blood vessels because uh, the platelet plug is relatively weak so it cannot uh, effectively seal uh, damaged or break in a large blood vessel for larger blood vessel a clot is much stronger and more effective in stopping bleeding now let's talk about blood clotting or coagulation we can see here we have the fibrin mesh or fibrin network fibrin is one of the clotting factors and trapped in the fibrin mesh are blood cells of different types and here we can see red blood cells because these are the predominant or the most abundant blood cells so normally the blood remains in the liquid form as long as it is in an intact blood vessel so it never coagulates or it never goes into clotting because the endothelium of the lining the blood vessel is intact so the clotting factors are not activated if the blood is taken out of the body and put in a test tube it will thicken and forms a gel like uh, structure it is called the clot that separates from the liquid so the liquid part of the blood will separate and in this case we called serum rather than plasma because the difference between serum and plasma that serum lacks the clotting factors or the clotting proteins because during the clotting process the clotting factors are consumed so they are out of the plasma that's why it is called serum clotting or coagulation is a series of chemical reactions that lead to the formation of fibrin threads that we see or that we can see them in this image clotting involves several substances called clotting factors and these are proteins mostly proteins not all of them are proteins but but mostly proteins and most of them are produced by the hepatocytes in the liver clotting factors are calcium as i said mostly proteins but some of them are not proteins and one of them is calcium calcium is a clotting factor and in addition to calcium we have several inactive enzymes that are produced mainly by the liver but we have some clotting factors that are produced outside the liver as we'll see later on so various uh, so these clotting factors are calcium several inactive enzymes produced by hepatocytes 
other various molecules associated with platelets and other molecules released by the damaged tissue. So all of these are considered clotting factors. Most clotting factors are indicated by Roman numbers like 1, 2, uh, 5 and 9, etc. And the number indicates the order of their discovery. So clotting factor 1 was discovered be before clotting factor 2 and so on. Clotting is a complex cascade of enzymatic reactions in which each clotting factor activates many molecules of the next reaction in a fixed sequence. So this will lead to a very big reaction. One factor will activate, for example, 100 molecules of the next factor in the cascade. And then the next factor in the cascade will activate many more molecules in the next step of the cascade. So we have a very explosive reaction and this will produce a very potent effect. So here we can see uh, different clotting factors. We have 12 clotting factors numbered from 1 uh, to 13. I said 12, but the numbers are till 13. As you can see, we don't have factor 6. So there is nothing called clotting factor 6. So the famous clotting factors are fibrinogen, which is the last factor in the clotting pathway, fibrinogen. We have also factor 2, prothrombin. As you can see, it is fibrinogen, it is inactive. When it is activated, it becomes fibrin. So fibrinogen is inactive, fibrin is active. Fibrinogen is soluble in the plasma, fibrin is insoluble. That's why it forms a network. Prothrombin is inactive. The active form is called thrombin. And as you can see, both are produced by the liver as most of the factors are produced by the liver except few of them. Also you can see that uh, the different factors contribute to the different pathways. For example, fibrinogen, prothrombin contribute to the common pathway. Other factors contribute to the extrinsic or intrinsic pathway. You don't need to memorize them at this level, but please remember that we have different factors, mostly produced by the liver. Okay. Uh, some contribute to the common pathway that I will explain later on. Others contribute to the extrinsic pathway while others contribute to the intrinsic pathway. I want to attract your attention that calcium is a non-protein uh, but it is a clotting factor and it is factor uh, 4. So please remember that. You can see also that the liver is the main source of the clotting factors, except few of them that are produced by the damaged tissues or activated platelets. Calcium, of course, mainly from diet, bones, and can also be released by platelets. We have factor five that can be also released by the platelets and factor 13 also can be produced and released by the platelets. So what are the three stages of clotting? I said common pathway, extrinsic, intrinsic. So we have different uh, pathways that contribute to three different stages of the clotting. So we have in the first stage, two pathways called extrinsic or intrinsic pathways lead to the formation of prothrombinase. So these or any of these two, any of them when it, whenever it is stimulated, the end result is the formation of prothrombinase. So you can see here, we have extrinsic pathway that was triggered by molecules or stimulants coming outside or coming from outside the damaged blood vessel, from the surrounding tissue. And we have intrinsic pathway. The stimulus is coming from the wall of the blood vessel or from inside the blood vessel. And both of them ultimately will lead to the formation of prothrombinase. And just I want to attract your att attention that prothrombinase is a complex formed by activated factor 10 plus factor 5 and factor 4, which is calcium. 
So this complex is called prothrombinase. And this prothrombinase, we'll see later on, will lead to the activation of or the formation of thrombin. Prothrombin will be converted to thrombin. So the first stage, as I said, either extrinsic or intrinsic pathway will lead to the formation of prothrombinase, which is a complex of activated factor 10, factor 5, and factor 4, which is calcium. And this prothrombinase is also called prothrombin activator. The second stage is where prothrombinase converts the enzyme prothrombin, which is inactive, produced by the liver, into thrombin. Thrombin now is active. Thrombin itself is an enzyme. And when it is active, it will lead to the conversion of fibrinogen, which is soluble, into fibrin, which is insoluble. The fibrin will form the threads of the clot. So you can see thrombin again in the third stage is an enzyme that will ultimately lead to the uh, formation of the active fibrin, which is insoluble. This will form the fibrin mesh or network that will trap different blood cells and will lead to the formation of the clot. One thing that I want you to notice that calcium, which is factor 4, is very important in all steps of the clotting cascade. You can see calcium is important in each step of the cascade, everywhere, in all the stages. So let's talk uh, a bit in details about the different stages. Stage one of clotting, which is the formation of prothrombinase. We have the extrinsic pathway where we have tissue trauma, release of uh, content of damaged cells around the blood vessel. And this factor is called tissue factor. This tissue factor is the stimulus or the trigger of the extrinsic pathway. In the presence of calcium, and we have many steps in the cascade. Ultimately, we have activated factor 10. Factor 10 will complex with factor 5 and calcium to form prothrombinase. So it is so called because tissue factor, which is also called thromboplastin, leaks into the blood from the outside of the blood vessel. That's why it is called extrinsic pathway, extrinsic to the blood vessel and initiate uh, the formation of prothrombinase. Tissue factor is a complex mixture of lipoproteins and phospholipids released from the surface of damaged cells around the blood vessel or in the tissue that is supplied by that blood vessel. In the presence of calcium, tissue factors begins a sequence of reactions that ultimately uh, activates clotting factor 10. Activated factor 10 combines with factor 4, uh, factor 5, sorry, in the presence of factor 4, which is calcium, to form the active enzyme prothrombinase, and this will complete the extrinsic pathway. So, this is the end of the extrinsic pathway, which is uh, part of stage one of the clotting process. Another pathway in this first stage of clotting is the intrinsic pathway. You can see here that uh, the blood trauma, any damage to the endothelium of the cell or endothelium of the blood vessel or any damage to the wall of the blood vessel. This will expose collagen fibers that are present in the blood vessel. Also damaged platelets for any reason or the platelets that adhere to the site of uh, injury. This will activate factor 12. Activated factor 12 in the presence of calcium will lead to the activation of factor 10. Factor 10 will complex with factor 5 and calcium and this will lead to the formation of prothrombinase. So in a more complex uh, pathway or the intrinsic pathway is more complex and occurs slower than the extrinsic pathway because it involves many steps. More uh, clotting factors are there in this cascade. 
The activators of this pathway are either in direct contact with the blood, such as subendothelial collagen, or contained within the blood, intrinsic to the blood. That's why it is called intrinsic pathway. The damaged platelets or damaged endothelial cells. If the endothelial cells become roughened or damaged, blood becomes in direct contact with the subendothelial collagen fibers of the blood vessel and platelets become activated, also damaged, this will activate uh, the clotting factor uh, 12, which eventually activates uh, clotting factor 10. Activated factor 10 combines with factor uh, 5 in the presence of calcium to form active enzyme prothrombinase. And this is similar to the end result of extrinsic pathway. In the second stage of the clotting pathway, which is very simple here, you can see that prothrombinase, which is a complex of activated factor 10, factor 5, and calcium, will uh, promote the conversion of prothrombin, which is inactive, produced by the liver. It is factor 2. In the presence of calcium, it will be converted to thrombin, the active form of the enzyme. So in the second stage, prothrombinase in the presence of calcium catalyzes the formation of thrombin from prothrombin. So very simple stage. Then in the third stage of the clotting factor, is, uh, of the clotting uh, process is the formation of fibrin. This is what we need to have a clot because it is insoluble. It will form fibers and then a network or mesh of fibers that will trap the blood cells to form the clot. So in the third stage, thrombin in the presence of calcium, as you can see, thrombin in the presence of calcium will activate or promote the conversion of fibrinogen, which is factor one produced by the liver into the loose fibrin threads. You can see also that thrombin will activate factor 13 and activated factor 13 will cause cross-linking between the fibrin fibers and this will cause stronger fibrin uh, network. So thrombin also activates factor 13, fibrin, it is also called fibrin stabilizing factor. It is released by, by hepatocytes and platelets and this activated factor 13 will cross-link the fibrin threads and stabilize the clot. So the clot will become stronger. Plasma contains some factor 13 because it is produced by hepatocytes. And also factor 13 is released by the platelets that are trapped in the clot. So we have two sources of factor 13, which is very important for the cross-linking of the clot to make stronger clot. Uh, after clot formation, the clot size will decrease and this is called clot retraction. Clot retraction is the consolidation or tightening of the fibrin clot. So the size of the clot will be reduced and this will help in re-establishing the blood flow through the blood vessel. Why there is retraction? This is due to the uh, features or the characteristics of platelets. The platelets that are trapped within the clot will contract and pull on the surrounding fibrin fibers. And this will pull the edges of the damaged blood vessel closer together. And if we have closer edges, this will help in the repair of the damage because we approximate the edges of, or the edges of the gap. During the retraction, some serum can escape between the fibrin threads, but the formed elements cannot. So the blood cells of different types will remain trapped within the clot. The normal retraction depends on the adequate number of platelets. So we need to have adequate number of platelets in the clot. 
because these platelets will release factor 13 which is the fibrin stabilizing factor and other factors uh, thereby strengthening and stabilizing the clot as the clot retracts fibroblasts that are present in the wall of the blood vessels will be stimulated by the platelet derived growth factor this factor is released by platelets as the name indicates and this factor after stimulating the fibroblasts this fibroblast will start to rebuild the blood vessel wall while the new endothelial cells are also stimulated by the vascular endothelial growth factor that helps in repairing the uh, damage in the blood vessel lining so we have now intact smooth endothelium lining the damaged area I said at the beginning that vitamin K is important in clotting vitamin K is not a clotting factor so be careful about that uh, vitamin K is important for clotting because it is essential for the formation of some clotting factors so the normal clotting depends on adequate levels of vitamin K in the body vitamin K is not directly involved in the actual clot formation uh, I didn't mention anything about vitamin K in that table about the clotting factors vitamin K is not one of the clotting factors it is required for the synthesis of four clotting factors and these are factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 and without vitamin K or with low levels of vitamin K in the body will have low levels of these factors and the clotting or the coagulation process will be affected and will have bleeding tendencies it is normally present in our diet but it is also produced by the microbiota or the bacteria or the good bacteria that are present in our large intestine vitamin k is a fat soluble vitamin that can be absorbed from the intestine or from mainly the large intestine clot after its formation is not a permanent solution it is just temporary it is there to seal the gap in the blood vessel until the damaged area is uh, repaired by an activated fibrinola, uh, fibrinoblast and by newly formed endothelial cells so clotting is not uh, meant as a permanent solution after blood vessel injury clots are dissolved once the damage is repaired and this is done by the fibrinolytic system also many times a day any part in the body or any part of the vascular system small clots can form and these small clots have the potential to become larger and larger and block or impair blood flow through the undamaged blood vessels for example the cerebral blood vessels coronary blood vessels so it is very important to have a mechanism in the body that can dissolve small inappropriate clots overall the dissolution of clot is called fibrinolysis uh, very important factor which is called tissue plasminogen activator where thrombin and activated factor 12 stimulate the conversion of plasminogen that is uh, released from the endothelial cells the intact endothelial cells it is plasma protein that is trapped in the clot to plasmine this plasmine is also called fibrinolysin and as the name indicates it can lyse the fibrin fibers so this plasmine or fibrinolysin digests the fibrin fibers and if we digest the fibrin fibers then the clot is dissolved fibrinolysis begins within two days and continues slowly over several days until the clot is completely dissolved okay now let's talk about the intravascular clotting the clotting that happens in undamaged blood vessels blood vessels that have no gap in the in their wall 
so clotting in unbroken blood vessels is called thrombosis or intravascular clotting it can be triggered by roughened endothelial surface due to atherosclerosis or trauma or infection or due to stasis the slow blood flow any slow blood flow in any part of the circulation can lead to intravascular clotting or thrombosis thrombus is the clot that develops and persists in unbroken blood vessel it may block circulation leading to tissue death like in stroke if it blocks cerebral artery then it will cause cerebral tissue death and this is stroke it, if, if it blocks the coronary artery then this leads to the damage to the myocardium and this will lead to myocardial infarction a thrombus also can separate or dislodge from its uh, site of origin and become an embolus this is a floating clot that is circulating in the uh, blood and this can block other areas an embolus could be blood clot also it can be air embolus like in fracture or trauma fat, fat embolus or a piece of debris that is freely floating in the bloodstream for example we have very famous type of emboli called the pulmonary emboli if a patient is bedridden for a long time deep vein thrombosis can lead to emboli that freely circulate in the blood and then they will become uh, lodged into the pulmonary blood vessels or the pulmonary arteries and this will impair the ability of the body to exchange gases between blood in the pulmonary circulation and the alveoli also we have a very common type of emboli called the cerebral emboli so any thrombus especially in the left atrium due to atrial fibrillation can dislodge emboli that will finally uh, end into the cerebral circulation and this can lead to stroke how to prevent undesirable clots how to prevent those clots like um, deep vein thrombosis how to prevent the pulmonary embolism how to prevent the cerebral emboli and so on substances clinically used to prevent undesirable clots are aspirin which is an anti-prostaglandine that inhibits thromboxan A2 formation and we know very well that thromboxan A2 is a potent vasoconstrictor and a potent mediator that triggers platelet adhesion so if we prevent vasoconstriction if we pla prevent platelet adhesion and then subsequent activation of platelets and the release of their content then we can prevent undesirable clots also another substance that is very commonly used in hospitals or in the clinical service is called heparin which is an anticoagulant used to clinically uh, or used clinically for the pre and post operative uh, cardiac care or any kind of surgery it activates antithrombin 3 which inhibits thrombin so it activates a factor called antithrombin 3 and this will prevent the formation of thrombin and if we prevent or block the formation of thrombin then we stop the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin and this will prevent the formation of clot then we have another substance called warfarin which acts as antagonist to vitamin k if we block the action of vitamin k then we will block the synthesis of factor 2 factor 7 factor 9 and factor 10 so the four clotting factors that are dependent on vitamin k Uh, now let me introduce some conditions that uh, present uh, to the clinic with excessive bleeding and one of them is vitamin k deficiency vitamin k is a fat soluble vitamin as i mentioned earlier so it can happen due to fat malabsorption so during this 
fat malabsorption. There is also malabsorption of this fat soluble vitamin and leads to vitamin K deficiency. Another cause of vitamin K deficiency is the use of broad spectrum antibiotic because the broad spectrum antibiotics will uh, damage or destroy the microbiota that are present in the large intestine and these microbiota are very important source for vitamin K. So if we lose them then we'll have vitamin K deficiency and this vitamin K deficiency will lead to the inability to produce the four clotting factors that are vitamin K dependent, factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. If we lose these factors, then this will affect the clotting pathways and lead to bleeding. Another condition that can lead to uh, excessive bleeding are liver diseases in general, because we know that the liver is the source of most of the clotting factor. So there will be inability to produce the clotting factors that are produced in the liver or by hepatocytes of the liver. A condition called hemophilia can present with excessive bleeding, which is a genetic bleeding disorder affecting male. And here there is inability to produce clotting factor eight, which is important in the intrinsic pathway and this will lead to severe bleeding. Another condition that can also present with excessive bleeding in the clinic is thrombocytopenia, which is low platelet count. Platelet count less than 150,000 per microliter of blood. And if it is less than 50,000, this will sure lead or definitely will lead to excessive bleeding. A condition where the number of circulating platelets is deficient. With this slide, I end my session. Thank you for your patience uh, and I wish you all the best. Have a nice day.